Integrated for today, we have a sponsored lecture by Theralogics on CoQ10 and fertility. And our speaker is Dr. Mark Ratner. And I'm going to share a little bit more about our speaker and our talk in a moment. First, I just want to um, um, do a little bit of housekeeping regarding healthy seminars and IFS. We have people here that are part of the IFS 2021, the Integrated Fertility Symposium. And we have people that are just part of the Healthy Seminars family, maybe first time or have been coming for a while. I do want to really let you know, remind you that when you go to healthyseminars.com, you click on resources and scroll down. This is where you find our calendar of events. And um, as you can see, today is our talk on CoQ10 and female fertility. And you can find out more about other talks by coming to the calendar. And if you scroll down, you can see what other events we have happening. Like later this week, we got a facial aging talk with Shelly Goldstein on cosmetic acupuncture and I'm um, part of the IFS only. So you have to be part of the IFS, but we got a licensed acupuncturist and a reproductive endocrinologist talking about COVID vaccines for women related to fertility and if they're pregnant. So we have, uh, that's gonna be part of the IFS pop-up lecture. So you do need to be part of the IFS to enjoy that. And we have lots of other things on our mentorship site. Now, if you want Okay, I'm unmuted again. If you want to um, uh, go to the IFS to see sponsor talks like this one and to interact more with the, with the, uh, the speakers and the companies, on the healthyseminars.com website, um, it says IFS 2021. So when you click on that, that will take you to the IFS website. And you can see on the conference calendar, when you check that out, we have some events that are just for IFS people. And like today, this is for anybody. Anybody's welcome to this lecture, but some of the lectures are just for IFS. And you should know that originally the Integrated Fertility Symposium 2021 online was going to end June 30th. And today, during this webinar, we have decided to extend that and reopen registration so more people can join in because we're going to have more pop-up lectures and we're going to have more public educational videos and more panels from our speakers and allow you more time with the forums and more time with the content for CEU, um, uh, finishing your CEU courses. So lots of good stuff um, for all of you guys. So. Let's talk about their logic because that's why we're here today. They've sponsored this lecture. So if you go to the sponsor page on IFS Symposium, remember you can get to that from the Healthy Seminars website, click on IFS 2021, it'll take you here. And when you go to the sponsor page, here's their logics, a little intro to the company. And if you scroll down, they have two incredible talks. And today we're gonna do a replay of CoQ10 and female infertility. They also have on this page, a talk on insulin resistance, PCOS, and the inositols. Another an excellent talk comparing my inositol and decar inositol, looking at a lot of the research. Excellent, excellent talk. But today we're going to talk about CoQ10 and female fertility. And Dr. Mark Ratner really shows in this lecture why or how the egg quality um, is impacted and what happens when the egg is doing its own cellular division, and then what's happening when it becomes an embryo, and why energy and CoQ10 is important. He's going to talk about the difference between ubiquinol and ubiquinone as well. So it's an excellent lecture, and the handouts are beautiful when you see these slides. If you want handouts, please contact Theralogix directly. They are more than happy to share handouts for this talk and for their insulin resistance talk. So when you're watching this a lecture and you're like, hey, I really want to see these handouts, um, just contact Theralogix. And if you go to the sponsor page on the Integrated Fertility Symposium and you go to Theralogix, you scroll down, there is a link that can take you to their site or you can just Google Theralogix and ask them for the handouts from the IFS lectures. And they said they're more than happy to share that as well as any other information you want to know about their products, et cetera. So I just want to let you know um, about that as well. Also, for those that are part of the Integrated Fertility Symposium, Theralogix is running a special. So when you go to our forums and under the forums, these are for those that are part of IFS. So if you haven't joined, register. And if you are part of it, click on special offers and you'll see all the sponsors have special offers and Theralogix has an offer there and they're probably gonna add more deals and stuff as well. So do check the special offers if you're looking to save 
wanting samples of stuff, contact them and see how that works. And um, again, I know they're really happy um, to talk to you guys. After this lecture, you want to watch it again, you can go to the sponsor page, the lecture's there. What we're going to do now is we're going to play a live replay of that lecture. It's about just under 30 minutes, I believe. And then Dr. Mark Radner's here live with us. And so during this live replay, he's going to take your questions. So post in the chat any questions you have for Dr. Mark Ratner. And at the end of this short lecture, and it is a powerful, impactful lecture, at the end of this lecture, he will take your questions. I will moderate those. I do want to remind you, our disclaimer is that this is for educational purposes only. This is not intended to be medical advice. Therefore, it should not be um, perceived or interpreted as medical advice. If you have a health condition, please do seek out a qualified healthcare provider. Again, this is for educational purposes only. During this live webinar, and team, you can bring up the video now. During this live webinar, I do want to let you know um, that we will post links in the chat again about finding um, the handouts. But if you, again, are looking for the handouts, please contact Theralogix. They're more than happy to share that with you. And if you're part of the IFS, check out the forms as you can now um, check to see what kind of specials they have on their products. And if you're not part of the IFS, you now have an opportunity to join because we've reopened registration and we're going to let this conference run throughout the summer so you can play with all the lectures, all the sponsor talks, all the pop-up lectures, all the public educational videos and the forums and chat. So um, I think it's going to be a good summer for all of us with this higher learning. And the higher learning begins right now because I've watched this lecture and we're in for a retreat. I'm excited to watch it for my third time. And I'm really looking forward to the Q&A with, with Dr. Mark Ratner. That's why we're doing these live events. It's the Q&A where we really get to pull out the clinical pearls. All right, without any further ado, team, let's start this replay and post your questions in the chat for Dr. Mark Ratner. Hi, this is Dr. Mark Ratner. I am the Chief Science Officer here at Theralogix. And during this brief video, I'm gonna explain the importance of coenzyme Q10 in female fertility. We'll start off by discussing egg quality and a concept that we call aneuploidy. And we'll then discuss why coenzyme Q10 is so important for egg energy production. We'll go over some of the published studies from the past seven or eight years about the importance of coenzyme Q10 and female fertility, and we'll end up talking about some treatment basics. What are the practical ways to use coenzyme Q10 with women facing fertility issues? So the question that we have to really consider here is why does it become more difficult for women to conceive as they get older? Many people start to think, well, the woman's just not making eggs. She's not ovulating as regularly. But in fact, the reason that this happens, the reason why women as they get older have a harder time getting pregnant is not because they are making fewer eggs. It's because the quality of the eggs that they are making starts to decline. And the reason that the egg quality starts to decline is because of something that we call aneuploidy. Aneuploidy, very simply stated, means an egg that has the wrong number of chromosomes. Now, let's uh, go back to some basics here and, and cover some stuff that uh, most of us learned in, in high school biology. Each of the cells in our body contains 46 chromosomes 23 pairs, except for sperm and egg. Now the sperm and the egg each contain 23 chromosomes, one copy of each of the 23 pairs. When the sperm and egg get together, you end up with an embryo that's got 23 pairs or 46 chromosomes. The process by which both the sperm and the egg are formed, we call that process meiosis. 
And what happens during meiosis is that those chromosome pairs split. And the egg ends up with 23 chromosomes, one from each of those pairs. So here's a great illustration, which shows us chromosomes, okay? And it shows us that each chromosome is made up of two what we call chromatids. That's a pair right there. And in the early or primary oocyte, before the chromosome pairs actually start to divide, the oocyte starts to create what we call spindle fibers. And they form from each end of the cell and they grow towards the middle. And those spindle fibers then attach themselves to each chromatid within the pair. In this illustration, you see the chromosomes are lined up in the center of the cell. The spindle fibers have grown to the center and they are attached on either side to one or the other chromatid. The fibers then start to separate and pull the chromosome pair apart. And they pull the chromatids towards either end of the cell. The primary oocyte then begins to divide in two. And as it divides in two, we end up with one of those two cells becoming the final oocyte, and the other one is called a polar body, and it shrivels up and it gets discarded. So we end up with an oocyte that has 23 chromosomes, one from each of the 23 pairs that we started off with. So when this happens normally, and we end up with a normal egg that has 23 chromosomes, that normal egg is called euploid. But, so in this illustration, we see, okay, we have the, we have the uh, oocyte with 23 chromosomes and the polar body got the other 23 chromosomes. But as I mentioned, that shrivels up and it gets discarded. So if the chromosome pair fails to separate properly and both members of the pair get pulled to one side or the other, we're gonna end up with an egg with an oocyte that's got either too few or too many chromosomes. And we call that an aneuploid egg. So here we see the egg on the left. It has 22 chromosomes because one of the pairs got pulled completely without splitting into the polar body, which has 24. So here you're gonna end up with an egg that's got one chromosome too few, 22 instead of 23. And here, the opposite has occurred. The entire pair got pulled to this side and you end up with an egg that's got 24. It's got an extra copy of one of those 23 pairs and the polar body only had 22, but again, that's just gonna be discarded. So you can end up with an egg that either has too many chromosomes or too few chromosomes, depending on how that mistake happens. So the key is that an egg that is aneuploid, an egg that has not the right number of chromosomes is usually not gonna fertilize. And so if in a given month, a woman ovulates and the egg she produces is aneuploid. It has either 22 or 24 chromosomes instead of 23. And a sperm penetrates that egg. Many times it's just not gonna fertilize. And so the woman doesn't get pregnant that month. But on some occasions, an aneuploid egg will fertilize. But then the embryo that forms has cells which are also aneuploid. And so if the egg had an extra chromosome, then every cell in the embryo will also have an extra chromosome. You'll end up with a, an embryo that's got 47 chromosomes instead of 46. But nearly all aneuploid embryos will either fail to implant in the uterine wall, or if they do implant, they'll miscarry within a few weeks. But there are some instances where an aneuploid egg leads to an aneuploid embryo and the baby can develop fully 
and is born. And the best example that we are all familiar with is Down syndrome. In Down syndrome, you've got an extra copy of the 21st chromosome. And so that, that chromosome pair of the pair of number 21 chromosomes, instead of splitting, you end up with two copies going into the egg. And then you get a third copy from the sperm and you end up with an embryo that's got three copies of chromosome 21. We call that trisomy 21. And you end up with a child having Down syndrome. So it turns out that egg aneuploidy, oocyte aneuploidy, increases as a woman gets older. And if we look at this curve here, the blue line, what you see is that once a woman hits about 35, the risk of aneuploidy in each month's egg starts to really go up to the point where when a woman is 43 or 44, nearly 70% of the eggs that she's going to produce on a monthly basis have the wrong number of chromosomes. And as a result, live birth rate starts to go down and miscarriage rate starts to go up. If we look, now that's the eggs. If we look at the embryos, it turns out that when they do IVF and they can actually test the embryos to see if they are euploid, the right number of chromosomes, or aneuploid, an abnormal number of chromosomes, what they discover is as maternal age goes up, the risk of having an embryo with an abnormal number of chromosomes, an aneuploid embryo, also goes up to the point where a woman of age 45, 84% of the embryos that she might produce will be aneuploid and have the wrong number of chromosomes. So then the question is, why does oocyte aneuploidy increase with maternal age? Why, as a woman gets older, do her eggs not have the right number of chromosomes? Well, it turns out that the separation of those pairs during meiosis, the ability of the egg to pull the chromosome pair apart and pull those two different chromosomes into the different size requires a huge amount of cellular energy. And as a woman ages, the coenzyme Q10 levels in the ovary decrease and that reduces the energy available to the oocyte. So that brings us really to the next step in this process, and that's to understand coenzyme Q10 and energy production. So mitochondria are really where all the action takes place in this, uh, in this situation. Uh, mitochondria are little tiny organelles. They are intracellular structures. We have them in all of our cells which serve as the powerhouse of the cell. It's where energy is produced inside the cell. The oocyte requires so much energy, it actually has more mitochondria than any single cell, any other single cell in the human body. But energy production in the mitochondria requires the action of coenzyme Q10. And in the egg, in the oocyte, coenzyme Q10 levels and energy production decrease with age, particularly after the age of 35. So what happens is we have reduced energy production in the oocyte, which impairs the ability of the chromosomes to separate during meiosis, and that increases the risk of an aneuploid egg and infertility. So the question is, how can we improve energy production in the oocytes of older women and reduce the risk of aneuploidy and improve fertility? We can increase the amount of available coenzyme Q10. So this was really only discovered about 10 years ago. And it was first discovered um, when they started to extract the fluid out of the follicle during IVF cycles. Um, and they would test the fluid for various 
nutrients and components. And what they discovered was that the amount of coenzyme Q10 in the follicle predicted the quality of the egg that had been in that follicle. So the more coenzyme Q10, the better the egg quality in that particular follicle. And then Dr. Bob Casper, fertility doctor up at uh, University of Toronto, published a study in 2013 where they supplemented aging female mice with coenzyme Q10. Older mice have the same issue as older women. That is, as those mice get older, they produce eggs that are aneuploid. Uh, and so what they did in 2013 is they supplemented mice with coenzyme Q10, and they discovered that they could produce eggs like young mice with much less aneuploiding. Casper and his team the following year then published a study that they did with women. And the Canadian study basically gave women either 600 milligrams of coenzyme Q10 per day or placebo. And these were all women over the age of 36 undergoing IVF. They then measured embryo aneuploidy and live birth rate. And what they found was a 35% reduction in embryo aneuploidy and a 24% increase in live birth rate in the group that had gotten coenzyme Q10. Then, three years later, a group that did another study basically measured once again the follicular concentration of coenzyme Q10, and they compared that not only to egg quality, but they compared that to embryo quality and pregnancy rates. And what they found was that um, the higher the coenzyme Q10 in a particular follicle that produced that egg, the better the embryo quality that came from that egg. And they found that the women that had the highest levels of coenzyme Q10 in their follicles had the highest pregnancy rates as well. Very interesting study then done in China and published in 2018. Um, this study was done at the Reproductive Medical Center of Peking. They looked at 186 women who were undergoing IVF and had been randomized to either no treatment, a control group, or given coenzyme Q10. These were all women who had diminished ovarian reserve, either on the basis of a low AMH or an antral follicle count of less than five. Interestingly, though, they were under the age of 35, but they all had diminished ovarian reserve. And they were treated, uh, the coenzyme Q10 group, with 200 milligrams of oil-based coenzyme Q10 three times a day, so a total of 600 milligrams. What they found was that the group that got coenzyme Q10 had a 35% reduction in the amount of fertility drugs, injectable fertility drugs that they needed for their cycle, and yet they had a 39% increase in their peak estrogen level. The number of eggs that were retrieved from each of the women in the coenzyme Q10 group was doubled. The fertilization rate went up by 50%. The clinical pregnancy rate improved by 84%, and the live birth rate increased by 86%. Over the past five years, there have been a number of other randomized trials done, and a meta-analysis was published last year which looked at five randomized trials with a total of roughly 450 women enrolled compared to control groups the coenzyme i'm sorry the coenzyme q10 treatment groups in this meta-analysis showed an increased clinical pregnancy rate of 94 percent and an increased live birth rate by 67 percent so it's pretty clear coenzyme q10 in women where we have egg quality issues is a significant tool um, that can help. So how do we go about using coenzyme Q10 for these women? Well, the first thing we should go is do is, is basically look at the basics here. Coenzyme Q10 is a fat soluble compound. We actually produce it in our bodies. It's present in virtually every cell um, and primarily, it's found in the mitochondria, where all the energy is being produced. 
In our body, coenzyme Q10 exists in two forms, and they each have a, a chemical name. One is called ubiquinone, and one is called ubiquinol. Um, and there's a lot of kind of marketing that takes place about which one is better, because both forms, ubiquinol and ubiquinone, are available as supplements. Um, but it turns out that when we ask that question, which form should we take as a supplement? The answer is, it doesn't matter. And here's why. Ubiquinol and ubiquinone are what we call a redox pair. Redox stands for reduced and oxidized. The body is constantly within our cells. The body is constantly switching back and forth between these two forms one being the oxidized form, ubiquinone, and that functions primarily in energy production in the mitochondria. And then ubiquinol is the reduced form, and they only differ by a hydrogen. In other words, the hydrogen is basically donated back and forth between these two forms. And so the reduced form primarily functions as an antioxidant, while the oxidized form primarily functions for energy production in the mitochondria but the body converts back and forth between ubiquinone and ubiquinol constantly. And so the notion that one form or another is better as a supplement really has no factual basis. Either supplement form can provide the same benefits. So what does matter is that CoQ10, because it is a large fat soluble molecule, it's extremely difficult to absorb it from the GI tract. And so the form ubiquinone or ubiquinol is not really the determining factor. It's not the critical factor. What is the critical factor is the formulation. It's the delivery vehicle for the coenzyme Q10 that will determine absorption and bioavailability. So there are products out there there are companies out there that make coenzyme Q10 in a dry powder form, and they'll press it into a tablet or they'll use the powder in a capsule and blend it with a lot of other things. But the studies have consistently shown that when the coenzyme Q10 is delivered in powder form, the absorption is under 1%. It's essentially non-absorbed. A more common way that you'll see coenzyme Q10 available is in a soft gel with an oil-based carrier, where the carrier inside the soft gel is rice bran oil or olive oil. There you're gonna get a little better absorption, somewhere in the range of two to 4% of the ingested dose will end up being absorbed. But a lot of work has been done to try to solubilize coenzyme Q10 and improve the absorption and bioavailability. And so products that use colloidal emulsification of the coenzyme Q10 inside the soft gel, what we call a self-emulsifying drug delivery system, or SEDS, they're gonna have absorption in the range of 10 to 12% of the ingested dose. So this is what we call a pharmacokinetic study. This is basically four different coenzyme Q10 products None of the four here was a powder form. It just basically doesn't even pay to study it because powder forms, tablets, and capsules of coenzyme Q10 are basically not absorbed at all. But what we can show you here is that with an oil-based carrier, um, this is what we call the 24-hour absorption curve. So just to show you on, on this arc, this axis, the y-axis, this is the, the blood level of coenzyme Q10, and this is the first 24 hours of absorption. So that's an oil-based carrier. If we look at a product that's got a colloidal emulsification, what we see is it's anywhere from three to six times better absorbed than an oil-based carrier. And so at Therologix, uh, we worked with a Swiss pharmaceutical company which has a, a, a colloidal emulsification process called Vesasor. Um, and as I'll show you in a minute, uh, we have developed a product that has really best-in-class absorption of the coenzyme Q10.
So the key takeaway here is that what's important is not how much you ingest, it's how much you absorb. Um, in most of the fertility studies that have been done with coenzyme Q10, they have used a dose of 600 milligrams of ubiquinone, uh, but in an oil-based soft gel. That's been the daily dose. However, if you use a CoQ10 that's delivered with a self-emulsifying delivery system, you'll get anywhere from 300 to 600% better absorption, so you can actually use a lower dose. Um, our product at Theralogix is called Neo-Q10, and each soft gel has 125 milligrams of coenzyme Q10, but it has been emulsified using an all-natural solubilization additive called Vesasor. Again, this is uh, something we worked on with a Swiss pharmaceutical company. And depending on what you're going to compare it to, you're going to get anywhere from a 300 to 600 percent increased absorption compared to standard coenzyme Q10 oil-based products. Um, it is dye-free and it is gluten-free. And this is one of the few coenzyme Q10 products that is independently content certified through a nonprofit third-party certification program at NSF International. For women who are trying to conceive, and I'll, let me go back for a second and just basically say, if, if a woman is already taking a prenatal vitamin, let's say, and just wants to add coenzyme Q10 to it, Neo-Q10 is a great option. But for a woman who is looking for a really best-in-class prenatal vitamin, and a woman who is over the age of 35, 36, and has egg quality issues where we're concerned about improving egg quality and reducing the risk of aneuploidy, uh, we make a product called Ovavite. And Ovavite is a preconception prenatal vitamin for women over the age of 35. Uh, it consists of, each day, a prenatal tablet plus two Neo-Q10 soft gels for a total of 250 milligrams of solubilized coenzyme Q10. And that's going to be anywhere from, that's going to be equivalent to anywhere from 750 to about 1,000 milligrams of coenzyme Q10 in an oil-based carrier. Uh, each of the tablets in Ovavite, the daily prenatal tablets, has 23 vitamins and minerals, including 2,000 units of vitamin D3, methylated folate. It's really a, a, a state-of-the-art, best evidence formulation for women trying to conceive. Um, it is dye-free and gluten-free, and again, independently content certified through the NSF program. So, optimal timing for women trying to conceive. Well, for couples that are trying natural conception, really this, this coenzyme Q10 should be used on an ongoing basis. Um, and we would suggest 250 milligrams per day of Neo-Q10 as an appropriate dose to improve egg quality. For couples that are doing ART, meaning either IUI or IVF, uh, it would really be ideal to start this regimen of coenzyme Q10, Neo-Q10, roughly six to eight weeks prior to the beginning of their treatment cycle. Um, so a couple of key points to remember, and uh, we're done. First, oocyte aneuploidy an egg with the wrong number of chromosomes is the most common cause of infertility in women over the age of 35. The risk of oocyte aneuploidy increases because as ovarian levels of coenzyme Q10 and energy production re are reduced with age, chromosome separation is impaired. Um, if we supplement coenzyme Q10 in women over the age of 35, we can reduce the risk of aneuploidy and improve fertility. And optimal coenzyme Q10 supplementation requires the use of a solubilized delivery form, which improves absorption and bioavailability. So thank you for watching. And for samples, product brochures, office program information, Here's contact information for our national sales director. Thanks again for your attention. Oh, I love this lecture. And again, thank you to Dr. Mark Ratner. 
Um, we're going to open up the questions um, in a moment. So again, to remind you guys, feel free to continue to post those questions in the chat. I want to remind you, if you want to rewatch this lecture, and if you want the handouts, then come to the IF Symposium website and under the sponsor page, um, you go to sponsors and then find Theralogics and then come to their page. And when you scroll down, there's a button to request handouts and product information. This lecture is here so you can rewatch this lecture. Um, and you don't even need part, you do not need to be part of the IFS to rewatch this lecture. It's also on our social media page for healthy seminars. And there's another lecture on insulin resistance PCOS that's also excellent. And you can watch that on their sponsor page and check out their handouts. If you're not part of the IFS, you can still join. We just reopened registration. We're gonna let this run for, um, until the end of August. And so the forums are becoming active, the chat feature, and we're gonna have more of these sponsored lectures. We're gonna have more panels with our speakers. We're gonna have more pop-up lectures and more public educational videos for you. So. We got too much content to end it at June 30th. So we're going more, um, you've asked for it and we got the content. So um, we have reopened registration. Again, these recordings are available on the sponsor page for Theralogics and so are their handouts. So do please um, contact them as they will be happy um, to send you this information. All right, we got Dr. Mark Ratner with us here now and I'm going to, uh, start to moderate these, uh, this Q and A. Um, I got to put on my glasses here because um, I don't have enough CoQ10 in my eyes. <laughs> um, Mark, should we be concerned um, about adding anything else into CoQ10? There's a lot of companies that are um, putting PQQ with uh, CoQ10. Would that impact the effectiveness or the absorption of the CoQ10? Um. Um, you know, I, I don't really have enough information about PQQ to, to answer that um, kind of uh, intelligently. Um, you know, the, the absorption issue um, is really just about enhancing the absorption of a fat-soluble substance. Um, you know, the way that we normally absorb fats from our diet is we emulsify them using bile. Um, and so the emulsification process essentially tries to enhance that, that same emulsification um, process. So PQQ um, is a, is a, uh, it's a sort of an ad, it's, a, it's an offshoot from CoQ10. It's, it's a, a different compound entirely, but it's never been studied um, in terms of aneuploidy or, or um, uh, egg energetics. Thank you. The next question is a common question about um, ubiquinol versus ubiquinone. And um, previously it's been shared in the literature that ubiquinol, while being more biologically active, had previously been too unstable to encapsulate. And now technology exists to, to um, stably encapsulate it. And so the questions around ubiquinol supplementation for OOSO quality versus ubiquinone, because we did have another speaker as part of the IFS, and she shared that the emulsification process stabilizes ubiquinol well enough to preserve its antioxidants, actually antioxidant capability. Even though the body uses both forms with, um, and interconverts, it seems what we heard is ubiquinol is still preferable because it saves the patient from having to use their own vitamin D. Um, is there any val validity here? No, I'm afraid not. I mean, the, here's the thing. Um, the two different forms, ubiquinone and ubiquinol, each serve a different role um, at, the, at the cellular level. Um, uh, ubiquinone is, is the form that is involved in what we call electron transfer. Um, ATP, which is produced in the mitochondria, uh, requires the transfer of electrons down this cascade, this chain of, of uh, enzymes. And the CoQ10 is one of the last steps. And it's ubiquinone that actually then does that, makes that transfer of the electron. Um, it then is converted to ubiquinol. And 
ubiquinol then functions as an antioxidant. So they serve two different purposes. Uh, it's, it's not vitamin E that, that pr provides the conversion. The other thing that, uh, I mean, the backstory of this is that virtually 90% of the, of the research that's been done um, with CoQ10 in all different endpoints, um, cardiac health, um, not only fertility, but other, um, uh, other areas of study, virtually 90% have, have used ubiquinone. Um, about 10 years ago, uh, a Japanese company called uh, Kanika um, figured out a way to commercially produce the reduced form, ubiquinol. Um, and so they started sponsoring research and providing a lot of marketing hype out there about this form. Um, but there is no evidence that there's any significant difference in terms of their biological activity, either form. The other thing that's been shown is when you take a soft gel that contains ubiquinol, the stomach, which is an oxidative environment. I mean, what happens to ubiquinol when it's exposed to oxygen is that it oxidizes and it converts to ubiquinone. Um, and so in the stomach, when the soft gel opens and the ubiquinol is released in the stomach, it's been shown that it's just converted to ubiquinone. And so we are absorbing ubiquinol supplements as ubiquinone anyway. So it really doesn't matter which form you take. Um, that's, that's the bottom line. That's what the science seems to tell us. So. Thank you for that. Yeah, and I know Ian's there. We have Ian from Theralogic is there. So we have more uh, medical questions, but I know Ian may want to say a few words. And I was going to hopefully, if Ian can unmute himself, there is a specific question that um, I think Ian can answer. They want to know if Theralogix offers private label options for practitioners. Yeah, typically we do not. Um, and uh, I did receive an email um, as well, and I'll respond back to you um, separate uh, from our conversation here. Typically, we do not offer private label, but um, we would be willing to uh, speak with you about your goals, um, and we may be able to help um, develop a product with you if, uh, if you have higher volumes that are uh, in mind in the future. Perfect. And then before we go to some more um, the science for Dr. Mark Radner, Ian, do you have anything you want to share? And I just want to again say thank you for constantly being a part of the IFS and organizing these two, what I have found very informative lectures. There was like, uh, as Mark and I talked earlier, 90% science. And then at the very end, you mentioned you have a product for this. But wow, it was really educational. So I really appreciate that. No, great. We're always glad to be here at the IFS. Um, I'm joined here also by Brittany Lark, who is our uh, Northwestern uh, representative in the United States. Um, but she's an, a licensed acupuncturist, too, who focused in fertility prior to joining Theralogix. So she's a great resource for all of you. And we um, right now during the show, which we will extend since Lauren is planning to extend the IFS, uh, are offering a 15% discount on initial wholesale orders. And we can also help you get set up uh, with digital referrals uh, directly from Theralogix. I know many of you use Fullscript out there. And uh, we have a platform, uh, although it is separate from Fullscript, that is more of a direct functionality similar to full script uh, that it creates a, an opportunity for, for us to have a partnership directly. So please be in touch uh, and we will help you proceed along those paths if you're interested. Uh, and we can certainly provide um, marketing materials, samples, et cetera, to your practices. Thank you, Ian. And Doctor, back to Dr. Mark Radner. In the Ovavite, the Theralogix CoQ10, is it meant to be taken all at once or should the CoQ10 be divided like uh, two times in a day? Um, any fat soluble nutrient is going to have its absorption enhanced if you take it with a meal that contains fat. So that that's obviously the case with fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K. Uh, but something like CoQ10 would even, you know, would, would qualify as well. Um, when we in, take a meal, when we have a meal that contains fat, we release bile acids, bile salts. 
and that's what help us that's what helps us uh, absorb it so these probably are going to be better absorbed um, and probably better tolerated although they're generally very well tolerated but uh, if they're not taken on an empty stomach but rather with food and preferably with with a, a fat containing meal and then um, in the study where the women were given the 600 milligrams of CoQ10 daily um, before their IVF cycle, the question is, are you familiar with or recall how long they took the CoQ10 in advance of the IVF yeah. process? The studies typically go anywhere from 60 to 90 days, two to three months prior to uh, egg retrieval. Um, now, these are very hard studies to get done. In fact, the original uh, study that Bob Casper did um, in in women um, in Toronto um, was uh, it lasted two years. Their goal was to enroll 40 couples, um, and uh, it was so difficult to enroll couples that they only got, after two years they only got I think 22 couples in, enrolled. And the reason these studies are so hard to do uh, in fertility couples is because this is an intervention that you know, you could potentially just walk down the street to the corner drugstore and buy. Um, so to do a placebo controlled study and, and every, you know, everybody here, if you work with fertility couples, you know, I mean, they want, they want to be pregnant yesterday. Um, and so the notion that they would come into a study where they're going to be potentially have a 50, 50 shot of getting placebo or the actual intervention where they could get that intervention down the street, um, is uh, is very hard to enroll couples in, in these types of interventional studies. Um, but when they've done these studies, it's typically been anywhere from 60 to 90 days. And then clinically from your experience, your uh, background as a urologist and, um, and then just your science director here, um, CoQ10 for men as well, or is that something that you're uh, you would be recommending? Yes, absolutely. Um, no question about it. Um, uh, CoQ10 um, in, in men, um, you get benefits from both the antioxidant uh, activity of, of the coenzyme Q10, which protects uh, basically uh, the sperm DNA. So it would re potentially reduce sperm DNA fragmentation, uh, but you also get um, and a motility benefit because uh, of the uh, energetics that are improved. Um, and actually the NeoQ10 product is, is now being used in a, um, a male factor study that's underway at uh, Cornell Medical School in New York, um, looking at men who have, um, who have semen analyses that are subfertile uh, and they're either getting placebo uh, or our male factor product uh, along with uh, CoQ10, our NeoQ10 product. Um, and then is um, the Ovovite has some iodine um, in the product. Um, any uh, precautions if patients have hypothyroid, if they're getting this CoQ10 with the extra iodine? It's a good question, but uh, you know, it's one that I think I'd probably have to punt on here um, to our nutrition department. Um, our prenatals all contain essentially the daily value of iodine for uh, pregnancy, um, which I believe is maybe 220 micrograms. Um, and so it, it's not really contained, I wouldn't say it contains extra iodine, it really contains <clears throat> the amount of iodine that is recommended for women uh, trying to conceive uh, or pregnant. And um, how that would interact with somebody who's hypothyroid, um, I don't know. I didn't treat much of that in, in my practice. So I, I, um, I'm not really in a position to answer uh, intelligently. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll jump in here for a moment, uh, Lauren and, and Mark. Um, and um, Sadie, uh, thank you for your question as well. It's nice to, to see you here. Um, I will relay your uh, question over to our research and education department and um, either our vice president of research and education, uh, Tiffany Knight will be in touch with you or Cynthia Clark, another one of our registered dietitians and they'll canvas the literature so that we get a very thorough response back to you. And um, I'll make sure to get back to Lauren too so that the community can be informed. We can put it in our IFS form. And that was the question I was gonna ask Ian is, you guys have that kind of support. So if there is a question like this, 
they can contact you. And if you have the literature answer, you give it back. And if not, you have that science committee where you guys search and look for it, correct? Yeah, we have we have three registered dietitians um, full time on staff at Therologics. And they really divide their time between um, speaking to uh, you know customers slash patients uh, and, and healthcare providers. Um, and so they are a great resource for us and uh, they get plenty of questions and they really dig in usually to, to do their best to uh, check the literature and, and get an accurate answer back. Thank you. So, so I want to remind everybody um, that we're going to extend the IFS and we're going to invite Dr. Mark Ratner back for another q &A. We're going to do a replay of the analysis hall talk and then we're going to be setting up panels throughout July and August and more Q&A with the speakers. And so if we have a PCOS talk or an OSCETL talk, we'll bring back Fiona McCulloch that you guys are familiar with, eh, Mark, uh, from Therologics knows Dr. Fiona McCulloch. And we'll bring a few of the experts back to talk about um, PCOS and OSCETLs and debate stuff. And um, we're here for learning, right? So I want to let you know that um, Dr. Ratner will be back um, to do a Q&A with us, and hopefully he'll get on a couple of panels. So not only do we have all the pop-up lectures we recorded, all the sponsored lectures, all the public educational lectures. If you don't know what I'm talking about, public educational lectures, PME, we created assets for you to share with your patients, created by experts, medical doctors, on um, inspiring patients to seek you out for integrative care. And then all the CEU lectures up to 36 hours. We have that. And we're going to add more content. <laughs> and so it is one of the best educational buffets um, that we're so proud of created. And there's just too much to do it by the end of June because we want to do more. And then there's the forums. Um, Mark's aware of the forums. So if we see a question that we think he can answer, you can either tag him in it or we'll let him know. And this is an opportunity for us to learn. If you're not part of the IFS, um, please join it. Registration has just opened up again um, and it's still discounted for you. And if you are part of the IFS, reminding you to check out the forums. There are discussions going on the forums on lots of different topics on egg quality, on PCOS, on endometriosis, et cetera. Um, Dr. Radner, thank you very much. Ian and Brittany from Therologics, thank you very much. And thank you guys for, um, um, for all of you tuning in to want to learn. Um, there's a lot of people here in our poll that said they were using, about 50% of you are already using CoQ10. And then there's 50% of you not using a lot. And I'm curious now that you saw this lecture, is this something that you're gonna to want to use with your patients more? Because I know myself and most fertility um, focused practices, it's kind of like a prenatal. Everybody gets a prenatal, everybody gets a CoQ10. Um, it seems like it's one of those things everybody gets. So now you're aware of a product that has some science behind it and support behind it. So hopefully um, you guys will check out their logics. And again, this is the time where we open up our mics so we'll open up our mics and you can send your love, your appreciation, your gratitude to Dr. Mark Ratner for presenting and giving of himself. So let's let's fill him up again so he's ready to do another one in July. Thank you so much, Dr. Ratner. That was awesome. Thank you. Good to see you all. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you guys for, for Thanks watching. so much. Thank you so much. Love Theralogics. Thank you. Record.